Theologically, during a song set like that, if I was the pastor, I would look up and I would give you one of these and you would just keep going. That's how we used to do it back in the, the charismatic world. And I will add this little addendum. Wouldn't be a bad idea if once in a while we just gave this signal around here and everywhere that I now reside theologically. It's just good to sing to Jesus, isn't it? It's wonderful. Uh, hard to, to, to hold in the emotion, the passion, even the tears, thinking about the Lord, how great He is, what He's done, who He is, how He saved us, how merciful and kind He is, how undeserved all of this is for any of us, and then to stand here and hear, hear voices just reverberating throughout this room and beyond a little taste of what heaven will be like. Huh? Yeah. All right, well, unfortunately, I can't give the signal. We can't just sing the whole time because the guys are going to get it. I promised you on Monday. Uh, I say that in love. What I want to do today is speak specifically uh, to the ladies about you men and the kind of man that you sisters ought to be looking for, waiting for, uh, holding out for. And this picture will help you also to know when to say, I'll pass. Uh, Johnny brought this up on Monday. There is a very unique circle here and, and in the Christian world especially where you'll find men who know how to play the game. You know the game I'm talking about, the spiritual game. Uh, they usually are, uh, you know, an Iwana veteran. They can spit out some Bible verses. They usually got a real sweet flow, I think you guys call it now, the hair is there, and you know, maybe a backwards hat or whatever the look is. They look cute in a hoodie. Often I find, as a next-gen pastor, uh, they, they can play a little guitar, right? <laughs> Just enough to be dangerous. <laughs> Not enough to make the band, but enough to, to drop the melody of the Tomlin song on the shore at the Santa Monica Pier, just off to the side, after walking you up and down a few times, ladies, smooth talker, takes you over by the hand, has a seat, pulls out his guitar, plays a little worship, sings to you because he can kind of hold enough of a tune that it's still cute. <laughs> and he's got you. You look spiritual. We're laughing because we know it's true and it's a little awkward and uncomfortable. It has not changed. I'm old now, 36. When I was in college, it was still the same way. Now as a pastor, I meet young dudes and I think, I saw you 20 years ago, bro. You weren't even born yet. I know your game, I know what you come with. And so sisters, don't be fooled. Cute little hair and the backwards hat, the hoodie, little master's man, wannabe with the guitar, playing the Tomlin on the beach, telling you all the right things, doesn't mean he's the right man, right? Doesn't at all. Uh, we got to go to the heart. We've got to put together a resume that matches scripture and even then use wise counsel and pastors and parents and mentors and even other friends when you look through uh, the narrative in Song of Solomon, beautiful poetic literature. As the storyline unfolds, you'll see the daughters of Jerusalem echoing on and on and on that this is the one. He is the man. He's not just attractive, but he's a man of reputation and character. Everybody is almost shoving them to the altar because it is well and good. In today's context, daddy is walking her down the aisle and he is excited because he's handing her off to that guy. That's the picture of God's will. That's the picture that every parent longs to see. And ladies, I know if you're a believer and even maybe if you're kind of figuring all that out, I, it's a good picture. I know most women in the world want this. And so uh, we talked about the trophy wife on Monday, not the world's definition of trophy wife, but the Bible's definition of what Proverbs 12.4 calls the crown jewel. And today, a message called Man of My Dreams. We'll see. Biblically, what the man of your dreams ought to be, sisters, 
Again, this is a topical list we're walking through. We just did a recent exposition on Song of Solomon, and uh, I know a lot of you guys were there. That'll go up on YouTube for free here in the coming months. But the biggest question we had back after that series was, okay, I got it. I understand expositionally Song of Solomon, attraction, intimacy, conflict, courting, dating, all of that. But, but what would the list look like? Where do I find ideas or characteristics? Where are some imperatives, some directives in the Bible that can help me as a woman, help me as a young man, put together my list? So I wanted to give you those on Monday and today. So let's get beyond just the focus on the outside and dig into the heart on the inside. Number one, very similar to Monday but now to you young men, sisters, he will be or must be a true believer in Jesus Christ. I put the words true believer in there because you need to make sure that he's vetted, that his testimony is true and sure, that his character and reputation are known. 2 Corinthians 6.14 is a passage that we brought up on Monday and are hinging to again in which Paul is encouraging and exhorting the church, commanding not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers, as clear as it ever could be. Young sisters, you do not hitch your life to a man who is not a believer. If he has not yet surrendered his life to Christ, you do not surrender your heart to him. It doesn't matter what common ground you find. You might like to play pickleball together. You might like the same kind of music, you might like to be foodies and have a good time and you get along recreationally, but the rubber will meet the road one day when you and your affection and your love for Christ outweighs and outpaces your love and affection for him because that's the way it truly is. We love Jesus even above or beyond our spouse, which actually makes us a better spouse. An unbelieving man is not going to understand that. He needs to be and wants to be the center of everything in your world. It will eventually become his way or the highway because Christ's commands are not his way. So what do you do with unbelievers in your life that are handsome and sweet and even moral? Well, go ahead and be sort of a a, a mutual friend with them, evangelize them, encourage them, introduce them to some of your master's buddies who can share the gospel with them, invite them to church, be a light, Be kind, they've been made in the image of God, but only a believing man gets the privilege of taking the next step with you on into dating or courtship. A common rebuttal to this idea is, well, what about Ruth in the Bible? Because we're good at making excuses when we want him. Well, first of all, he ain't Boaz. He's not a worshiper of Yahweh. If he's not a believer, he's not in your circles, he's not vetted, his reputation isn't even close to Boaz. Second of all, Boaz didn't even marry Ruth until after Ruth 1.16 when she declared uh, to her own mother-in-law after losing her husband, your people will be my people, your God will be my God. God. So Boaz wasn't missionary dating. Sorry to ruin it for you. Uh, Ruth, Boaz, believers in Yahweh. Now that love story is not an out for us sisters to target the unbelieving man and missionary date. Uh, when you make the list of the man of your dreams and you pray and ask God to help you wait for him, to bring him, and you tell the Lord, I trust you, make sure that believer in Jesus Christ isn't just sort of a throw-in to please your parents or to, because you know you've got to say that one. Uh, make sure you settle for nothing less than a man who loves Christ more than anything in this world. Many imposters will come along, seemingly, looking like a prince, but many are a pretender. This is why, sisters, you have to seek wise counsel. And young men, assess your heart. Examine your own conversion. Are you vetted? Uh, Do the mentors, the older godly men in your life, verify that you are being sanctified, that there is fruit in your life? Have you been baptized? Have you put together a resume of faithfulness? You don't need to do that for 10 years to be Uh, worthy of a godly woman. Some of you do, but most of you, if 
you just continue to walk in obedience to Christ, the people around you are going to see and identify those things, and that's the real fun about relationships, is the endorsement of godly people gives you such a credibility and such an affirmation, you don't have to ever think that you manipulated this thing. It's the same thing for guys like me and others in pastoral ministry. You don't self-appoint and self-anoint, but older, wiser men lay hands on you as by way of endorsement that you are 1 Timothy 3. It's the best feeling in the world in relationships and in ministry to know you didn't make it happen, you didn't appoint yourself, you have been endorsed to this position. So it is with marriage and relationships. In Song of Solomon, chapter one, verse three, we see a line that helps us to assess the character, even the conversion of a man. It says, your name is like purified oil, speaking about a man whose name is so reputable. He is a worshiper of our God. His character vetted. It is not unreasonable, sisters. It is not unkind to make a man wait, to be his cordial friend, to enjoy fellowship with one another, and all of those things while you wait and assess, is this a man whose name is like purified oil? Is he a godly man? And young men, you don't, Seek Christ to gain a woman. You don't dangle that carrot even in front of your own mind and your own eyes thinking, well, I'll take Jesus because then I can have her. If you don't love Christ more than her, we're already in trouble. Because you're going to need to love him most, love him more than anything else in the world in order to lead her and love her like him him how do you love her like Christ loves the church if you don't even love Christ and so weigh your heart everything in godly healthy lasting relationships will stem from a heart that has been transformed by Jesus number two equal to the sisters as we talked about on Monday this will be a man who is actively being discipled actively Not a guy who went to a Bible study for three weeks. Not the guy who signs up for small groups every semester and never follows through, but says, yeah, I'm in a small group. Yeah, I signed up. Yeah, I do do that. I do this. I do that. No, somebody who is actively being discipled. In the Bible, the Greek word for disciple, methedes, the idea of being a learner, a pupil. Is he a learner? Is he a student of God's word? The right man will know how to follow the right men. And so ask, sisters, dig in and inquire, who are the men who shape him? Who are the mentors in his life? Watch them. Look for them. Because you will become who you follow in this world. Namely, Christ, also by way of his disciples and mentors and leaders in our life, those whom we follow, we tend to look like them, sound like them, act like them. We see their homes, their marriages, their ministries, their demeanor, their character, their integrity, the way they handle everything, not when everyone's watching, but behind the scenes. Those type of influences in a man's life will come to fruition in your own marriage. Now, I know this to be true, not only because the Bible paints that picture, as Paul explains over and over, imitate me as I imitate Christ. But in my own life, for better or for worse, I've told a mentor of mine this repeatedly, I look at my home sometimes and I see his. I look at my marriage, I look at decisions I make, and I, by the grace of God, get to thank this man over and over and over again because he pressed in, branded my life, imprinted our home and my marriage. If there's any stability in our life, it's because of Christ and his use of men like this in my life. And I look and think, wow, it is so true. We will become the type of individual, gentlemen, that we place ourselves under. Are you under men that are more disciplined than you, that are serious about truth, that are lovers of life, Are you under men who honor their wife, honor women, honor marriage? Are you under men who will sharpen you like Proverbs 27, 7? As iron sharpens one man, so another. That is the kind of man, ladies, you want to be looking for 
Why? Because the Bible says so. Okay, but why? Because he has to disciple your home. He has to disciple you. He has to be the man of the house. He has to, if God provides and opens the womb or if you adopt, he has to disciple your children. He has to lead your home. If he's never learned to follow, how will he lead? If he's never been discipled, how will he disciple? See, God does it, yes, and the Holy Spirit's our teacher, yes, and there's all these wonderful truths in the Bible that show us God will have his way with the heart of a man, but time and time again, the New Testament paints a picture of leaders in a man's life shaping him so that he can go on, be trusted with truth, and then become also and lead like a faithful Man, The why isn't always or only because the Bible says so or because this is right or this is moral. It's because in 20 years, you will see the results of your decisions today. Play the long game with them. Your home, your future, and a generation depends on it. Number three, in that same vein, he's submissive to authority. First Peter 5.5, 5, I love the way Peter just brings it you always can tell he he doesn't really care what anyone's going to think but he loves the church so deeply he'll tell them the truth he says likewise on the heels of instructions to church leaders in chapter 5 verses 1 to 4 comes out swinging for the younger men likewise you who are younger be submissive to the elders all of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. If you're writing down 1 Peter 5.5, 5, that's a very wise thing to do, ladies. You see if a man measure up to this. Is he submissive to the elders of a church or does he always think he's smarter because he took his first Greek class? Even if he's better educated than your godly rule pastor, who didn't get the chance to go to the masters, who didn't end up at the seminary, who isn't as quote unquote educated with the letters behind his name, but he is as First Timothy 3, one through seven as they come and he teaches the word and he's a faithful leader. How does your handsome respond to that kind of headship? Does he sit there leaning over? You pronounced that one wrong. This guy, where'd he go to school? Is he submissive to elders? Is he gracious? Is he kind? Is he mature? But even more so in 1 Peter 5.5, 5, is he humble? Doesn't matter how smart he is. Matters how he handles his smarts. Is he humble? Does he have respect for an older man with gray hair, knowing that it's a crown of wisdom? It's an older man's glory. Does he always have something to learn? Is there always a takeaway when he's around older men? Is he always learning so that he can be a better leader? How dangerous, how dangerous, sisters, it is if you submit to a man who is not submissive and brothers Assess your own heart. Be the kind of godly man who holds up the mirror and is okay having to admit, you know what? I'm kind of a headstrong bull in a china shop. I just seem to break everything around me. I need some help. I need to be shaped. I've got ambition. I've got passion. I've got drive. But I need an older, wiser man to press in on me. I need the fat trimmed. I need a man with a chisel to shape me a little more like Jesus because I really struggle with pride. And I think I'm somebody. And you know what, I, I might even be somebody. Look at how good I am at this. Look at how talented I am at that. Look at my stats. Hey, perfect. Get honest. Show an older, wiser mentor the ugly. Show him the pride. Show him what you think of yourself and then let that brother shape you and take out the ax that the Holy Spirit used, chop you down a few levels, you will come out as a 23, 24, 25 year old, leaps and bounds ahead of your contemporary peers because you've already started dealing with the issue that most men deal with for the rest of their life. 
gorilla pounding on the chest. I'm the man. Pride. Start now, brothers. Let it be marked on your resume. Submissive, teachable, humble, available. You're just always there. You're always around. What did you say? Yes, sir. I'm on it. That kind of young man stands head and shoulders above the rest and yet he doesn't act like he's head and shoulders above the rest. What if a man who's not submissive to authority goes rogue in your marriage, ladies? What if it's time for church discipline, but he won't show up? If he's not learned to submit, he won't be the man of your dreams. He will be a living nightmare for you. Number four, he is self-controlled. Uh, we're going to live in Titus 2, 6, 7, 8, and on for uh, a few more of these as well. In 2 Timothy, bringing in a little bit of the pastorals, uh, Paul says in Titus 2, 6, likewise urge the younger man to be self-controlled. So number four on the list, but quite possibly the number one secret sauce to success in life, self-control. You guys probably hear this a lot. Because you're at that age where a lot of the leaders who love you so much want to help you with self-control. It can be hard to be self-controlled. It's a campus filled with a bunch of 18 to 20-somethings full of hormones and everything else under the sun. Self-control is important, isn't it? It's vital. Younger men, think about this. If you can learn and strive by grace through the strength that Christ provides you in the power of the Holy Spirit to control your actions, control your mouth, control your lusts, control your decisions, your emotions, your pride, your passions, you are preparing to be a young woman's dream husband one day. Because the rest of life is that. You know it doesn't change? That's the best news I can give you all day. Let me give you reality. It never changes. Some of you, 18, 36. I don't know how old Harry Walls is. <laughs> Still looks good. But he's older, wiser, mature. Every single generation Every man living in a different era, a different decade, a different age range will tell you the same thing. It never changes. Sin comes to your door knocking and demanding, let me in. You've been so good. You've been so self-controlled. You're so godly. You should enjoy this. You should enjoy that. You deserve this. The serpent has not stopped whispering. Did God really say since the Garden of Eden. He comes to you, young men, whispering, loosen up, lighten up. A man of self-control is preparing for that moment. The world will tell you to just let it fly. Live how you want, do what you want. You're the big man, you're the big dog, full of testosterone. Also, Hollywood makes a great deal of fun with this. You've got the out-of-control man. You ever see the sitcoms where it, the, the, the woman is, is fit or pretty or hygienic at the very least? Everything's in order because of her. And what's the guy? Usually, he's fat, lazy, he's a slob, he's frazzled, he's sweaty, He's always out of control. He doesn't have it put together. She has to lead because he just can't figure it out. And it's endearing to Hollywood. It's beautiful. It's so awesome. Oh, look at the strong woman because this dude is a dud. People love it in the world because it endorses and affirms their own carnal reversal of marital roles. Not that a woman is supposed to be like the man I just described. But no, a godly man is anything but the man I just described. You know, it's hilarious now. It's a big joke to be a 30-year-old kid eating junk food, living in your mom's basement, just goofing around, having a good time. 
But more than that, the world beckons that you become a YouTuber and get paid for it. Nothing wrong with using media. Johnny's on YouTube. I'm on YouTube. We use a little YouTube. But you know what I'm talking about, the Jake Paul clowning around stuff, just being a fool to get attention and make money. You know, we laugh and people think, oh, this is cool. I want to do that or I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to do this. And then life goes on and you see the clowns like Jake Paul are not recipes for success. Right now it's funny. Right now they're rich in about 20 years. They're old, they're scarred, they're usually broke. They've got a body count behind them of brokenness and broken relationships. They've got STDs. They're usually paying alimony or child support. Now who wants to be a YouTuber? Constantly trying to figure out the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and the next thing that's gonna make me some Buddy, you know LeBron James when he retires, 38, 39 years old, he's got to figure out what he's going to do with the rest of his life. A believer, 38, 48, 58, 18, it don't matter. You are living for something better, something greater, something now, but also something not yet. And you don't have to run around like a chicken with your head cut off looking for purpose and looking for significance. You learn now. Come under the control of the Holy Spirit. Make your life count. Make your life count matter set your eyes on the things that are above and watch ladies as you grow old with a man that doesn't need anything this world can offer because he already has what he needs the most and brothers i challenge you now during these four years or however many you have left here to ask the holy spirit for help to train you Beg him and plead with him. Make me a man who glorifies Jesus. Make me a man under control. Make me a man under subjection to your word. Make me content. I want to know that I know that I know that I have everything I need because I have Jesus. Pray that prayer. He'll do it. Number five, coming out of that same vein, pressing a little further into this, You need a man who's killing Peter Pan. He's killing Peter Pan. What do I mean by that? We're going to go a little further into this idea. I'm not done beating on this horse. 2 Timothy 2.22. Paul, giving a young protege in the faith instruction, tells him, flee youthful passions. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, along with those who call on the Lord with a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know they only breed quarrels. He's given instruction to Timothy as a church leader. Don't get caught up in the little boy stuff, the little controversies, the little he said, she said, the little debates of the day. Don't get caught up in that stuff. You fly high. You keep your eyes focused. Don't be getting caught up in youthful passions as well, a phrase most certainly linked to sexual immorality, the things of the flesh that pull you off course, pursue righteousness. You kill Peter Pan, brothers. You kill him. Remember Peter Pan? Never want to grow up? Want to fly around? Be immortal? A little boy still? Everybody else is growing up, still flying around with your weird little wings and your sword. You know, the Peter Pan mentality is still around today. You picture the the dude just sitting around with his headset on, yelling on Xbox Live. All night, you know, benders on Call of Duty trying to get ranked. Fortnite whatever else you play still. Nothing wrong with playing video games, guys. Nothing wrong with wearing a headset either and having a little fun with your buddies online. But when that stuff crushes your spiritual priorities, when you become obsessed with a virtual non-reality, 
it's going to take you years to break the little boy habits that you're supposed to be training in breaking now to prepare to lead a home and love one of the daughters that the king has given you. Literally run away from things that take over your eyes and your mind, whether it is an over-obsession with video games, whether it's pornography, whether it's endless scrolling or swiping on TikTok, video after video after video after video, and before you know it, three hours has gone by in the morning, another four at night, you lie there in bed, and your eyes are captivated by this small little device that has taken over you, and you are spiritually dry. The well is empty. You're wondering why you're struggling with all of these secret sins that you think no one knows about, but otherwise or godly men have been there, would love to talk with you about it, and yet you are bound You have to go to war against that sin. You know sin hates you? You know TikTok and all the dances and all the goofy stuff? You know the obsession with video games? You know pornography? You know it hates you. Sin hates you. It doesn't love you. That phone looking back at you that you think is so endearing and is yours, looking back at you like you're somebody and something, it hates you. It is waging war against your soul. It loves it. Satan loves it when you commit adultery. Satan loves it when you're bound to pornography. Satan loves it when you are wasting your time. I'm not talking again about some good things and having a little fun, having a little recreation. I'm talking about sin waging war against you. It is good for us to flip our mentality that technology and these things are not merely neutral. They are anti-God, anti-fidelity, anti purity and so when are you brothers going to join the fight and wage war against the things of this world don't hear what I'm not saying I'm not saying you hole up like an Amish guy in a field somewhere with your horse and buggy and nobody's allowed to ever have screen time I'm not talking about that and you know it I'm talking about viewing things as though they're merely benign neutral not a big deal because you're just having fun a godly mature man sees that as peter pan mentality adulthood is what you're striving for and might i be even more honest it's what you're already in so brothers are you assessing, reassessing, and giving over to older, wiser men their own assessment of your life, your habits, your recreations, your loves, your addictions. If you have no plan for keeping your hands busy biblically, mark my words, sin is coming for you. And it's excited that you have no strategy against it. But God is a better way. He wants more for you. He's given you everything, Peter writes, that pertains to life and godliness. You're not without weapons in this war. You've been given all that you need. The question is, will you take up the sword and fight? Number six, he's, in, he's exemplary in good work. Still in Titus 2, 6 and 7. Uh, Paul says, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works and in your teaching show integrity and dignity, obviously instruction to a church leader who's to be appointing church leaders. But think about this for a second. Our church leaders are those who are to humbly, faithfully model for us faithfulness. Then we do what? We follow them. In 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4, the word example a type, sort of a statue is the original language, the use there. The picture is this. Model your life after this individual. Well, marry a guy like that who's an example of good works, who is serving, sharing the truth, bearing the burdens of others, showing compassion, living for the gospel. Is he a door-opening, chivalrous, Caring, kind, compassionate, generous, gracious servant. It's not hard to find them. You just got to look in the right places. If a man is exemplary in his good works, with a true testimony of faith, not superficial, moralistic living, 
but true faith working itself out through his godly example, modeling after his faithful church leaders. He can be trusted. He can be depended on. He has proven to be dependable already. Number seven, he is a godly talker. The mouth may be the last great battleground, that and the mind, the way we think, because we think nobody knows what's going on up there. Nobody can see it. But eventually it works itself out of our mouths. Multiple passages reference the way we're to talk. I could preach another two days on our speech expositionally from multiple places. Titus 2.8, sound in speech that cannot be condemned. So an opponent may be put to shame having nothing evil to say about us. Even an enemy of a faithful church leader would say, well, I don't agree with him, but his mouth, the way he speaks, is pure and right. First Timothy 4.12, let no one dis- despise you for your youth, but set the example for believers in speech and conduct. Paul goes on with Timothy in that particular passage, the mouth being key for the exemplary leader. Ephesians 4.29, though, to all the church, all Christians, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. This one is helpful because... It's so obvious. Ladies, do not justify a man who has a potty mouth. It's not funny. It's not cute. It's not oops. It's not a slip of the tongue. Maybe he needs to grow. He'll be sanctified. Everybody makes mistakes. Your mouth gets the best to you. I understand that. It happens to everyone. However, if it is a habitual pattern in which he has filthy speech, and it becomes a punchline, and you're dating, courting, moving forward towards holy matrimony. You don't have holy matrimony. You have an unholy man with a filthy mouth. Pastorally, we see this often. A recent study done showed that 84% of nearly half a million abuse hotline calls was verbal abuse from men to their wives. You think we got a problem in society with our mouth? Not every abuser throws his fists. The mouth, the cutting mouth. That in the privacy of your home, ladies, one day, if not dealt with now, brothers, will become the catalyst for war, brokenness. If children are in their picture as they observe father cutting down mother, but then rolling to church on Sunday, steering the family Tahoe like it's all good. Everybody in their Sunday best. Mama puts on her makeup and a smile. Only to go home for Sunday brunch and do it all over again. Why? Because we were attracted to all the wrong things or seemingly right things in the wrong order. Men, deal with your mouth. Many things on this list I had to deal with 10 years ago. I was a false convert, a late convert, and bless my heart, bless my wife's heart, I needed heart surgery. I needed Jesus to do a work. I had a college coach that used to tell us, fellas, the habits you are developing now during these four years on the field, in the classroom, and in your apartment or dorm room are going to go on with you for the next four years. Will the woman you marry and the family you raise have to deal with the habits you are forming now? Yes. Will they be pleased with what they are dealing with? Well, they wish you would have dealt with it sooner. I used to roll my eyes, didn't care, was just there to play baseball and have a good time in Dallas. Got married and realized I was going to be picking up the pieces for a while. And look, God's faithful, he's merciful, he's kind, but the pain is real when we form habits 
that are ungodly and we don't face them and deal with them. There's really only two reasons why some of you brothers aren't gonna deal with them. Number one, you're an unbeliever playing the master's game and you got in here and I pray that God gets a hold of you and you repent and you get truly saved here. There's another reason is you guys are scared and you're afraid that you're gonna lose something. You are in the best place you could possibly be to get honest about your sin. Because it's a place that puts a flag in the ground and says, hey, beacon of truth found here. The true gospel found here. The word rightly divided found here. So come and get it. Come and access it. Come and put it into practice. Don't be scared to get honest about your sin. Don't be scared to confess. Be eager to. You're in a place that will walk with you and take sanctification and your holiness and your testimony of faith so seriously that you're going to get everything you need before you go out into this world. And most certainly, before you begin to grow your family. How do you talk? A few more and we'll wrap up. He's growing in wisdom. Number eight, Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Don't follow somebody who's unwise. Look for a man who fears the Lord, is growing in wisdom, when you have questions, when you bring up topics, is he the jokester in the corner that never seems to say anything of value, but he's so cute and funny? Or is he a man who thinks, processes, is prudent, sees life through the lens of Scripture? Young men, that starts with fearing the Lord. It doesn't start with your classes and your books and who you can quote. It doesn't even start with your exegetical work and how you're pumped and you're going to go to the master's seminary and become our next great warrior leader. God bless you. I hope he does that for you, through you, and in you. But here's the deal. Wisdom ain't about you getting a 4.0 or any kind of scholarship for your academic ability. Wisdom starts with do you fear the Lord? If I stick you on a deserted island and there's no seminary, no fancy letters, if I put you in Africa as a missionary, or if you do become a pastor and you end up in seminary, fear of the Lord will carry you through every single day of your life. You're all about the master. You're all about the Lord. Ladies, does he look like that? Number nine. Uh, he has an outstanding reputation. I already dealt with this because I just couldn't keep under control about a good name early on. Proverbs 22, 1 though, a passage that you can write down, you can memorize and take to the bank. A good name is to be chosen or desired rather than great riches. Favor is better than silver and gold. A good name, credibility. You obtained a good name in the Bible the same way you obtain a good name now. Work hard, honor authority, treat others with respect, be a man of integrity, a man of character, and have the right convictions and live by them in humility and godliness. So many young men make the mistake of living for the now. That's instant gratification, microwave mentality. Brothers, be of the mind that thinks delayed gratification. Play the long game. I'm making decisions now that I'm not gonna experience the full fruit of but in 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 15 years, I will. Do you know those people you meet? You're like, man, how'd they do all this? Or how'd they accomplish this? Or how did it get like this? They have been plodding along one faithful step at a time. That starts now with having a godly reputation, making the right decisions. People have a long memory. I've got some wonderful friends in college who... By God's grace, we still stay connected and, and we high five that Jesus saved me and they were really gracious and kind back then. I got a few other brothers that are still pretty suspect of me. Did you know that? Guys I went to school with that think still, nah. I've seen him do way too many things. I was with him here. I was with him there. I, I was with him all those years. There's no way. I don't, let me see him go 15 years first. Then I'll have a burger with him and believe it. People have long memories, brothers. 
Now, in the end, does it matter? No, I answer to an audience of one. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. But by way of principle, it's sobering, isn't it? That people are going to remember the way you are, even if Jesus changes you. The fact that you didn't care to make the right decisions now can come back to haunt you. God wants more for you. A good name is mentioned over and over in the Bible because God has a way of using your reputation for his glory. He can do it the reverse way as well because you blew it a bunch and then he saves you. And he uses broken people to do things for his glory, yes, but even now, what kind of reputation are you building? If you know the truth and you've come to understand the truth, do you walk in the truth? And finally, the same as to the ladies on Monday, he's fearlessly loyal to Christ. Fearlessly loyal to Christ. When Paul is exhorting the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 16, verses 13 and 14, he tells the men, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men. Why, what is acting like a man? Well, being firm in the faith. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 through 15, Paul is exhorting, encouraging, even praising the church at Thessalonica. He says, but we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification of the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm. Hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. What is Paul's instruction to men in the church time and time again? You be faithful, you be faithful, you be faithful. What does faithfulness look like? It looks like standing in the truth that you have come to know and being loyal to Christ above all else. We live in a dark day. It is chaos. You are going to be dealing with conversations about gender, sexuality, women, men, race, truth, speculation, controversy, conspiracy, government, politics, on and on and on and on again, in addition to everything else under the sun that each generation deals with. Sisters, There is no time to waste on a man who is not fearlessly loyal to Christ. He cannot be a man who will faint when he needs to be fearless. What if persecution comes? What if it becomes like it is in so many other countries around the world in America And you've picked a man because he's cute and cuddly and he says all the right things, but when the bullets are flying, he's hiding behind you. You want a warrior, a man of truth. Not one who postures with pride that he's something. No, a man who is steady, faithful, meditating on the things of God, able to discharge the word at a moment's notice. Uncommon boldness, brothers, in a hostile culture. The kind of man who will speak the truth in a group of unbelievers, the kind of man who will speak the truth in a Christian university classroom is the kind of man who will also speak the truth in his home, to his wife, to his children, in his church, and God will be greatly glorified through you. There's a passage I want you to write down and then we'll close because I'm out of time. Ephesians 5, 22 to 32. Most of you have sat in churches that unpack this text every few years or so or in marriage workshops. I want you to read that tonight. And brothers and sisters, both of you, Ask this question after you read it tonight and pray to the Lord. How can a man be submitted to if he first is not submissive? How can a man be sacrificially loving 
a woman if he isn't first sacrificially living for Christ? How can a man expect his wife to respect him when he's not respectable? How can he lead if he isn't worth following? Brothers, you are the future. The future is now. You're not kids anymore. You are men. You are going to leave this place and you are going to join the front lines with brothers that are your age and that are twice your age. They are going to look at you and expect you to walk in godliness if you profess your faith in Christ. You are going to lead homes, lead marriages, raise children. Will that be triumph or tragedy? My prayer is that you choose to follow God's way. You take this list, add to it, make it your own, pray. If some of you need to break up, break up. Talk to your RAs or whatever they're called here. Cry, pray, work it out. Go back to your collective corner. Grow in godliness and come back. Do it again. Maybe that's God's will for you. That's great. But focus first on serving Christ, being the kind of person that the Bible praises for their faithfulness to the Lord before walking the aisle and walking the union together. Let me pray for you, and then I believe you are all dismissed after Harry Walls gives you instruction. Father, help us please to take seriously your call on our lives as young men and young women. Above all else, it's been said on Monday, I'll say it again today, we pray it again today, all of this is impossible to do unless the gospel transforms us and so save us first. We're not trying to be moralists. We're not just making a list to get by and check boxes. We need you, Jesus, to transform us. But if we have been transformed and we've been going through the motions, I pray that you would call us back to a fierce and faithful follower mentality, obeying you in all things to enjoy the beauty and blessing of relationships. In Jesus' name, amen.